this morning. Um, I do believe that God laid something on my heart for you today that is going to encourage you in a great way. Uh, but I do have some bad news. My watch broke. It currently says it's uh, quarter after 10, <laughs> which is what time it's said all morning. So um, we might be here a while. Okay, <laughs> by the sun, yeah. <laughs> Isn't there some sort of thing where you can put your thumb up? I don't know. Anyway, uh, no, we, we, we'll have a, a good service this morning. I want to uh, thank you again for continuing to uh, bless us and invite me back. Uh, it's nice to be invited back to some places. I've been to places where I preach where they'd never invite me back. So <laughs> it's nice to be invited back to, to places and uh, to see so many people. And uh, it's actually nice to have name tags. I think... The last time I was here, I don't know if it was the first Sunday, but it was still a relatively new thing that you were using the name tags. And uh, I like that because I recognize a lot of you, but I can't remember your names. I apologize. Um, you, you get reminded of my name every time I'm going to be here, but I'm not reminded of your name when I come. So uh, I, I like the name tags. And uh, again, thankful to be here. So I have some slides. Um, oh, first, first things first. How many of you have your phone? put that up there, leave that there. How many of you have your phones? I did this last time, I'm going to do it again. If you have your phone, grab your phone, go to Facebook, check in, let people know that you're here. Uh, lots of people are willing to check in to baseball games or football games or sporting events. I do it all over the place. In fact, I have a really funny story about checking in. Uh, we were in Toronto and uh, went to a restaurant and I checked in at the restaurant. Went home, didn't think anything about it. The next day, I got a Facebook message from someone that said, were you at Eden, was the name of the restaurant, were you at Eden yesterday for lunch? And I said, yes. And they said, well, I saw that you checked in. You dropped your social insurance card on the floor, and we found it. And we looked up where you've been, and we left it at the restaurant, and you can go pick it up. And I went back to the restaurant, and there was not just that, but my birth certificate and a whole bunch of other personal information that somebody had found because I checked in. So it's not a bad thing. Check in. Let people know where you are, what you're doing. I already did it first thing when I got here this morning before we even started. Checked in and let people know. Um, because I believe that the message that this church has is a message that people need to hear. I believe in what you're doing, I believe in your pastor, and I'm just thankful that I can be a, a little part of it. So, how many of you know who Bob Ross is? Some of you? He's a painter. So here we have, the, the title of today's message is You Just Got Bob Ross, okay? So he was a painter who kind of invented a style of painting where he did it very quickly, and he had an old PBS show where he would, within half an hour, he would paint these masterpieces. And uh, so we're going to get back to that, but first we're going to read today's passage of scripture, and that's Revelation chapter 22 and verse 13. I think I have it up there. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can come together. We thank you that you love us and that you care for us. And today I pray that as your word goes forth, it would land on soft ground that would receive it, and that it would produce great fruit in our lives. We thank you again for your love, for your grace, and for your mercy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So my grandfather built the house I live in. And I have a picture of my grandfather, I think. This is my grandfather and my grandmother when they were getting married. He built her a house as a wedding gift. Leading up to the wedding, he built this house. And... Um, he actually built them two houses in, the, in, in his lifetime. How many houses have any of you built? Anybody? There might be a few carpenters here, so I'm, I'm assuming someone built a house. Okay. He built two houses for his bride, which I find to be fantastic. And here's a picture of me and my grandfather. This is when I was in college, okay? So I look a little different. Uh, <laughs> this is me and my grandfather, and I love my grandfather so much. He, we spent so much time together. He was the coolest guy. I actually lived with him as he got a little older and couldn't really take care of himself anymore uh, as much. He could still, he, I, he would not have wanted me to say that I was taking care of him, uh, but I was there just in case some, he needed something. And um, so it was around 50 years ago or so where he built the house that I currently live in. And it's actually the house in the background there. And you know, something about houses that are 50 years old is 
they still aren't what they used to be. There's some things that have changed in 50 years. And some of the things that have happened is that at one point 50 years ago, some things may have looked really, really nice. And now, um, how can I put this nicely? They're a little ugly. <laughs> now, I'm sure when my grandfather built this house, it was beautiful. It looked great. But now it looks a little ugly. So I got, a, I got some pictures that I want to show you of my house. So you can go to the next one. So this is the front step, uh, which you can see he has green carpet on it, which I guess was something that people wanted to do in the 60s or 70s, whenever it was. It was sort of indoor-outdoor carpet. Um, but now it's, you know, the, the concrete is crumbling and it's kind of falling apart. Uh, why don't you go to... And actually, if you see the um, shop vac, that's because it gets wet in the basement. I'm sure none of you have ever dealt with water in your basement before, right? That's, that's just me? No, it's not. Go, you can go to the next one. This is the green wall. Um, it's this green tile, which again, I'm sure, and maybe you love it, but it's not my style at all. Um, I don't find it particularly attractive. You can go to the next one. This is in the bathroom where the floor is kind of peeling up. And uh, I didn't have to do anything to take this picture. This is what it looks like, okay? And we got some, some molding. We're going to fix it. But this is what it looks like. And, then you, and you can see this is blue tile. It's different than the green tile, but kind of the same. And I think there's one more picture. Yeah, this is the floor in the kitchen. How many have a floor like that in your kitchen? Or have had one in your life, you know? Because uh, that was what it was. And, and, but over time, you can see there's like a little scratch taken out. I mean, I had to find the scratch, obviously. Obviously, I took these pictures for a purpose, right? I didn't take the nicest pictures. I took the ones that showed the, the faults and the issues. Because over time, when a house has been built and is standing for a long time, there starts to be some problems starts to be some issues. The first one is that, again, it could be ugly. We have this mirror. I couldn't, I couldn't really take a picture of the mirror, but we have this mirror that has these little, they're, they're, they're probably one foot squared pieces that are all put together, and then they have gold paint sort of swirled on them. Anybody seen, a, seen one of those mirrors? Okay. So we, we, we have that, and uh, then, of course, we have the carpet. Oh, I think I took a picture of the carpet. Go to the next one. One of these brown, brownish, orangish carpets. Anybody have one of those in the past or currently? Okay. Again, it's not that they're bad. It's just time changes, right? Most people have laminate floors now or wood floors and things. Over time, things change. One of the things with living in a house like this is, in an older house, is sure it's functional, but sometimes there's things that are a little ugly. Or sometimes there's things that are a little broken. In fact, we have an issue in our shower where the shower head needs a thing put behind it to hold it in place because it doesn't fit quite right. That's the stuff you deal with when you live in a house that's seen some age. And, and it's not a bad thing, but stuff is kind of ugly or stuff is kind of broken or stuff is kind of laid out funny. We have a huge living room. It's big. And a small kitchen and a tiny bathroom. Like, very small, which I guess was what, you know, people did at the time. I've been in a lot of old houses, I've been, and, and the bathrooms are always really small. If you go buy a new house now, if you build a brand new house, the bathrooms are as big as the kitchen, because people want room, and they want to be able to walk around, but that's not how it always was. Things get broken. We've had to have the roof fixed. We've had to have the garage doors fixed, and even things that used to work. We used to have, a, you know, the electric door opener. It's broken now, so we just have to lift the garage door so things are kind of ugly things are kind of broken things don't look like we would maybe want them to look and you know what if you spend every day all day in a house looking at all the issues you can start to get a little frustrated you can start to feel a little overwhelming how many things aren't quite right how many things aren't exactly where they should be or exactly where we want them to be or i wish this I wish this color was changed, or maybe I should paint this, or maybe I need to fix this, and I need to fix that. We have one window that we've had the plastic over for about three years, because it's a weird shape, because my grandfather, being the carpenter that he was, made most of the windows. He would go and cut the glass, he would glue the frames, he would put them in place. Well, that's great, except that now when you want to go buy windows, they don't have windows that fit the holes. So you either have to make one, or you have to fix everything. It just doesn't work. And, and I mean, it was awesome that he could do that, but 
listen, my, my house building skills are not enough. <laughs> I'm lucky to get the plastic over the window accurately, okay? So that's, those are the things, and it's so easy to sit in the house and just look at all the problems. This is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is broken, this doesn't fit. Wait, I, I, through a long story, a mouse trap went off and the mouse got stuck behind the refrigerator. And I thought, I'll just pull the refrigerator out and get the mouse trap. But my grandfather built the cupboard, the cabinets above the refrigerator, and when he laid the floor, realized that the refrigerator was about maybe two inches, maybe that much, too tall to slide in. So he notched the floor down and slid the refrigerator in. So I couldn't get the refrigerator out because it was stuck on the floor. So eventually I had to lift it up and tip it, and my uncle was there, and of course we tipped it forward just without thinking enough. <laughs> and all of a sudden the door swung open and the orange juice fell out and there was food all over the floor. And if you, if you just get caught up in all that little stuff, it can be pretty annoying. You can be pretty bothered. Now, some people I know, maybe that doesn't bother you as much. Maybe, maybe you're not that vain. Maybe the little things don't bother you. But, you know, I've been around enough to know that just about everyone has something that kind of bothers them. Well, since the weather's been nice, I've been doing a lot of biking and also a lot of walking, but I prefer to bike. And uh, I live in Knoxford, and if you've ever been to Knoxford, there's tons of hills. So if you go up, up, uh, down the road, and you go out towards River to Shoot, it's just out that way. There's tons of hills, beautiful to bike. And I went for a walk the other night, and I walked to the top of a hill, and I took, I took a picture, so I think I got a picture here. So this is a picture from the top of the hill. Um, and if you go to the next picture... See this right here, this little, uh, maybe you can't see it, but there's a little spot right there. That's my house. And when I climbed to the top of this hill, and I turned around, I was taking pictures, and all of a sudden I saw my house tucked into this little corner side of the hill with Marcel Mountain in the background and the windmills. I thought, my house looks like a Bob Ross painting. <laughs> he always put, now if you don't know him, he always would put, He'd call them happy little trees and happy little clouds. And then he'd put a little house in it. And I looked at this and I thought, my house looks like it's in a painting. Now, this isn't a really, really good uh, picture because I just took it with my phone. But what happened is I was looking at it and I just started thinking, this is a beautiful place to live. This is amazing that my house looks like this. Like, this is something that people would take a picture of and put on the wall in a hotel. <laughs> like if they had good cameras and it looked nice. See, when I'm in my house, it's very easy for me to pick out all the issues and all the things that are wrong. But when my perspective changed, all of a sudden I looked at my house and I thought, wow, that's beautiful. I live in a beautiful place. And my mind was no longer thinking about those ugly steps in the front with the green all-weather carpet that are breaking and falling apart. My mind wasn't thinking about the ugly tiles. If you like the tiles, I'm sorry. We can just agree to disagree. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't thinking about how the flooring in the bathroom over time has started to peel up in places. I wasn't thinking about the brown and orange and whatever carpet that's um, really not very attractive. Uh, I wasn't thinking about those things. I was looking at this picture of my own house thinking, wow, it's beautiful. Because my perspective changed. Well, I want to talk about perspective a little bit this morning. Because sometimes in life, we get stuck in our own perspective. And really what I want to talk to you about today is God's perspective. So we read that passage of scripture from Revelation. I don't know if I have it right there or not. Yes. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Isn't that a crazy perspective for God to have? I mean, if you just think about this for a minute, the, the Alpha and Omega, basically what he's saying is that he has the perspective of all of eternity. From the beginning to the end, the first to the last. In not just humanity, but also in your life. He has this perspective where he can literally see everything. It's all laid out before him. 
I thought about that for some time. Thought about what it would mean to have that kind of perspective. What God has seen through this perspective of beginning and end, first and last, alpha and omega, what he has seen. It means that he has seen the absolute greatest that society has to offer. But it also means he's seen the absolute worst. He's seen all the great projects, all the great things that people have done. But he's also seen all of the terrible, horrible, devastating things that humanity has done. He has this perspective. And actually, I thought about that, and then I got a little bit more worried when I started to think about how he has that perspective on my life. See, it's not just as society that he sees the first, the beginning, and the end, and all of the goodness, but also all of the failure. You know, he also sees that in me. He sees the moments where I've been doing really, really well, and he sees the moments where I've failed miserably. He hasn't just seen everything. He's also heard everything. He's heard the praise and he's heard the curse. He's heard the people as they worship. We worshiped here this morning. He's heard us. But he's also heard the people as they've turned from him, as they've put people down, as they've marginalized people, told them they're worthless, told them they don't belong, told them they don't matter. Think about this perspective that God has been the first and the last. He's seen and heard everything. All of it. He has this perspective where he's able to stand back and see everything. As I, the more I thought about it, the more it kind of freaked me out, to be honest. <laughs> Because I don't think I have that perspective all the time. And to be totally honest, I don't want that perspective. I like to know the good stuff. I don't need you to share all your bad stuff. Now, you've got to have people in your life that you can share with when you're struggling and when you fail. But probably you shouldn't do that with everyone. But God has this huge perspective, this massive understanding. This is the first and this is the last. This is where I am. I've been here through it all. And yet, looking through that perspective, he loves us. Amen. And I, I read this verse, Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, first and the last, and I can't stop thinking about how God has such a great perspective of our life. He knows all the ins and outs. He knows all the successes, but he knows all the failures. And yet he still loves us. He still cares about us. To be totally honest... If it was us, many of us would give up after the failures. We'd give up on each other. It's good to have a couple of people you can talk to, but truthfully, if you let everybody know what's going on, what the dirty secrets are, what the bad news is, there's a lot of people who would give up. Hopefully there's enough people in your life who won't give up. I believe this church is a church that won't give up on people. That's why I love coming here. Because... People have struggles and people have issues, but I know your pastor and I know enough of you to know that the struggles don't make you give up. And God's not going to give up. In fact, this passage, the next passage of scripture in Romans, why don't we go that up there? Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says this, But God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So in this process, of first and last, of God having this perspective that oversees all of our lives. He saw all of the negatives. He saw all of the failures. He saw all of the issues. And instead of running away, he ran to us. He came to us. He came right to where we are to give his life for us. God commanded his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, while there were still issues, while there were still problems, while there were still trials, while there were still failures, that's when he came to love us. Not when everything was perfect, not when everything was just how we wanted it, not when everything looked right. 
But when everything was a mess, when everything was broken, when everything was falling apart, that's when he came. That's who he came for. In fact, at one point in the scripture, he even says, you know, I didn't come for the, for the people who are well. I came for the people who are sick. I came for the people who have struggles. I came for the people who have issues. If you think you've got it all together, I'm not here for you. I'm here for the people who know I'm a mess. This is broken and this is messed up and things aren't going the way that I want them to, but I know I need God. And that's when God says, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. He has this perspective where he can look at your life. And remember, we already talked about it. He knows so much about your life. More than you do. He even knows the things that you're afraid to admit to yourself. He knows it all. He's heard it all. He's heard the moments you've praised. He's heard the moments you've cursed. (laughs) And even while you were still a sinner, he gave his life for you. Man, that's good news. That's why we call it gospel, right? That's good news because he has this perspective where he can see the worst of you. And yet he still loves you. And he still cares for you. And he still has a plan for you. And he still has a purpose for your life. Even in the middle of failures. Even in the middle of brokenness. Now I don't believe God wants us to stay in the middle of failures and brokenness. Because he's better at that than I am. I still have the plastic on my window for the last three years trying to keep the air out. I don't even know if it works. He knows how to fix the window. He knows how to work on your life. That's why we come to church every week, because I believe God wants to work on our hearts, work on our spirits. He wants to take the things that are broken and and hurt, and he wants to bring healing and wholeness into our life. Sometimes it's a long process. Sometimes it's something that he just speaks to us in that moment, and all of a sudden we're rejuvenated, and all of a sudden we have life again. But I believe that that's what God wants for us. But what I came this morning to help you understand or to, to... hopefully relay to your heart is that he knows so much about you but even in your worst moments he's still reaching out with love even while we were still sinners even while we had failed he has that perspective Bob Ross painted with perspective because if you've ever been in the forest, you know, there's lots of trees. Actually, I went for a bike ride yesterday, uh, two days ago, and there was a tree, and I don't know how it happened. It was just one tree, and it was right on the edge of the road, and it was coming up, and it was just bent like this. And it was a big tree. It wasn't, it wasn't a little tree. It was a big one. And it was bent. All the rest of the trees were standing upright, but for some reason, that one tree had bent over, and it was almost making like an archway. It actually might have even been tall enough to walk under. It was, it was big. When you go through the woods, you see there's trees that are broken, and there's maybe things that are dead, and things that don't. But if you get the right perspective, you can find beauty. I today think that sometimes you and I get caught up in our lives looking at all the brokenness, looking at all the hurts, looking at all the failures, looking at all of those things that we've gone through, and somehow, in some way, we lose perspective. We start to snowball the bad things. We start to think about all of the bad things. Anybody here ever have back trouble? I mean, if you don't want to raise your hand, you don't have to, but I, I, I pinched my sciatic nerve, actually herniated a disc, and, uh, it was the most painful thing I had ever experienced. I couldn't walk. I went to the um, I went to the drugstore to get some pain medicine, and they didn't open till nine. And I got there at about eight forty-five, and I just sat in the car, and tears just rolled down my face because the pain was so intense. It just hurt so bad. Well, it's been almost a year. Actually, probably has been a year since I did that. Haven't had any more of those painful moments. I've kind of learned how to stretch properly and do the exercises to keep, keep it from being an issue. But if I wake up in the morning and I kind of twist funny, the first thing I think is, uh-oh, what if, I, what if my back 
What if I did that? What if, what if the disc got herniated again? What if, what if, what if, what if? And with the wrong perspective in our lives, whoops. With the wrong perspectives in our lives, we live in what if. What if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? But God's perspective isn't concerned with all the what ifs. He isn't concerned with all of the mistakes and failures because he sees how beautiful and amazing you are. You were created by him for him. And he sees that beauty and he sees who you are. He knows the failures, he knows the mistakes, and even while you were still a sinner, still in the middle of failure, far from him, that's when he showed his love towards you. God commended or showed his love towards us. That's how he showed his love. It's easy to love when everything's perfect, right? It's a lot harder to love when there's struggles and issues. God said, I'm going to show you my love even in the middle of your issues. I'm going to send my son to die, to give his life for you. So I want to encourage you today. I want to let you know. He sees those issues. He sees those struggles. He sees what's broken. But he loves you. He cares for you. He wants to help. He wants to fix. So we can know that no matter where we are, no matter what we've gone through, it's not a secret to God. He doesn't, he's not, keep, he, you're not keeping secrets from him. He knows. His perspective says, I've seen it all. I've heard it all. I know it all, but I want to know you. I want to be part of your life. I want to be part of what's going on in your life. I uh, appreciate cataract surgery. I had cataract surgery. I was in a car accident a uh, long time ago now, close to 20 years, I guess. And uh, banged myself up real bad, broke basically every bone in my face, <laughs> uh, and came through all the healing, did all the plastic surgery, all that stuff. Uh, doctors were great, all that sort of stuff. And then two years ago, I was laying in bed, and I was reading, and I kind of rolled over, and one eye closed. And all of a sudden, there were no words on the page because I was only looking out of my right eye. And I thought, well, that's clearly there's some sort of issue going on here, <laughs> because that shouldn't be happening. And over time, my vision in my right eye got progressively worse and worse, and uh, I went to the optometrist, and they said, you have a cataract, so we're going to have to do that, because sometimes when people suffer head trauma, they develop a cataract. And so I went, and at the end, before I had surgery, the cataract was so bad that I couldn't see my hand right in front of my face. I was completely, it was completely blind. It was, it was 100% blind. Uh, I could see if the lights were on. That was it. Um, couldn't see anything out of that side. It was such a severe cataract that the doctor who was going to do the surgery came in and was going to examine it and didn't even need a magnifying glass. He just looked in my eye and he said, oh, I can see it. <laughs> it's right there, just covering. My eye looked glassy. It was it was all there. Now, thankfully, I, I agree, I'm thanking God for this surgery because I can see everyone here, can, whatever. My eyesight's perfect in that eye. Um, it's amazing. A cataract's not very big, is it? Just a film that gets over your eye. But if it's right in front of you, you can't see anything. Think about it like this songbook. If I hold the songbook out here, I can see everybody here, right? I think, yeah, nobody up there. I can see you all. If I hold it here, I can only see the people on this side and this side. If I hold it here, I can only see a few of you over in that corner. And, yeah, I can see one person. Oh, wait, I had to move my head. See, I couldn't see anybody over there. Now, this book isn't that big, is it? Well, I mean, I guess if you don't like to read, maybe it looks like a big book. But <laughs> in the scope of the world, this isn't that big. This is somewhat small. 
One of the things that I've noticed about people is that we're really good at taking small things and making a big deal out of them. And when you take the small things in your life, and I used my house as an example because the carpet is ugly. I just, if you like the brown, orange carpet colors, great. You're welcome to have mine. <laughs> you can come and pull it up and, and keep it for yourself. Uh, I don't think it's attractive. But it's not that big of a deal. I wish it was different. But for some of us in our lives, now um, we're moving from the natural to the spiritual, emotional, soulish side of things. There's probably some things in your life that are like a brown carpet. And the more you think about them, the bigger they get. And maybe you wake up one day and something happens, just like with my back, and now all of a sudden that's what's on your mind. And all of a sudden this thing, which really isn't that big, is blocking out so much of your life. It's not that big, but you've put it right in front of you. And it's the only thing you can think about, and it's the only thing you can talk about. And when you go to the grocery store, that's what you talk about. When you go to your friends' houses, that's what you talk about. When you're at work, that's what you talk about. And it's not so big, but it's so close that you can't see past it. I want to help you today with your perspective. I want to help you to know... Oh, good. It's only quarter after 10. <clears throat> I got lots more notes. We'll just keep going, okay? <laughs> I want to help you with your perspective. I want you to know. Those things in your life, they matter to God. He'll help you pull up your carpet. Whatever that is in your life. And again, I'm talking about your spirit. I'm talking about not your actual carpet. There might be people here who will help you with your actual carpet, but... Whatever those things are in your life, he wants to help. But those things aren't keeping him away. Those things aren't causing him to push you back. In fact, your struggles and your failures and your issues are causing him to come to where you are. Right now, in this service, because I've done this for basically my whole life, as an adult, for sure, I know there's people here who you've got some stuff going on. Some failures, some issues, some things in your life. And I'm just here today to encourage you. Let's bring up the, the last one. You need to get Bob Rost. You need to get the perspective. You need to understand that what you're going through doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. doesn't mean that God doesn't care for you. In fact, it's the opposite of that. What you're going through means that God is coming to where you are. In fact, it might even be why you're in this place this morning. Maybe you needed to hear this. I like to think that. As a preacher, I like to think that you're here because, and I'm speaking this message because God wanted me to relate to you to the fact that even though you're struggling, even though you've got issues, even though there's things going on in your life, he's running to where you are. He wants to be with you. He wants to be part of your life. He's, he's not pushing you away. He's trying to be where you are. And you're here today, and I'm preaching this message, and I like to think it's because of that. Because he wants to be part of your life. He knows the issues. He knows the struggles. He'll help you. But he won't run away. He'll run to where you are. While you were still a sinner, you need to get the perspective. Don't get so caught up in the issues that you can't see how much God loves you. That's the perspective we need to change. Because we can get caught up in how all these things have failed. We can get caught up. Are you taking a picture, Aaron? Or are you doing a video? If you're taking a picture, I want to be like... <laughs> all right. People are going to wish they were here this morning. Your pastor is not going to know what to do with it. Where was I? <laughs> In closing. In closing. <laughs> oh, I was posing. Yeah, right. Perspective, though, right? That's what we were talking about. 
That sometimes we get so caught up in our issues that we don't see how much God loves us. That's the perspective. The first perspective we need to change is that even though we have issues in our life, even though we have struggles in our life and failures and all of these things, the first perspective we need to change is we need to understand that even in our worst, God loves us. That's the starting point. And when we start from that perspective, all of a sudden, all of the issues and the brown carpet and the green walls and the ugly this and the broken that, all of a sudden, we start to understand that those things, yeah, they're issues. They can be fixed. But God loves us anyway. And he's going to help us. Trust me, you don't want me to come to your house and fix anything. Please trust me. (laughs) When something needs fixed, you need to bring the person in who actually knows what they're doing. Who actually knows how to fix it. That's who God is for us. So why don't we stand together this morning. I wasn't serious, you know. (laughs) That's all right. It's quarter after ten. We need to get going. (laughs) Thank you so much for having us again this morning. And... uh, Love the church. You are always in my prayers, and uh, I think about the great work you do here often, and if I can manage, I'm going to try to bring my kids up to VBS. It's not that far, so I I think I can work that out, Uh, but we're going to try, and I really appreciate this morning. Let's just pray together. Lord, we thank you that you have a perspective of our lives that shows you our worst, and that you still love us. You still care about us. You still sent your son to die on the cross so that we could be free. Lord, today I pray if there's someone in this place who doesn't really know that freedom, who's never come to know you, Lord, that they would open your heart, their heart to your love. That they would open up who they are to you. Because you're not running away just because we have issues, just because we have failures. You're running to us. And I thank you for your great love. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank thank you that there is nothing broken in our lives that you can't help fix and restore. God, we give you the glory today. We thank you for the perspective of your love. Help us to not get so caught up in the issues of our life that we lose out and we lose sight of your great love for us. We give you all glory and honor today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.